the talk that I'll be presenting is about um, the use of open street maps in the disaster prevention and mitigation efforts of the Philippines. Uh, I am part of Project NOAA, as Celine mentioned, and Project NOAA is really a collection of research and development projects that were put together and operationalized so that uh, it can help in the disaster efforts of the country. And Project NOAA was uh, launched on July 6, 2012, and we're about four years old already. Now, throughout the four years and throughout the many years that we've been studying uh, disasters in the Philippines, I've been involved for almost two decades with search and rescue efforts, and I've seen a lot of dead people. I've seen a lot of problems involved during search and rescue operations, and um, there were a lot of lessons that we learned from each and every disaster of the country. And we've learned that disaster efforts in the Philippines can be broadly categorized into two. The first is warning, which is basically the responsibility of government. Warnings must be accurate, reliable, understandable, and timely. And it's largely the responsibility of NDRMC, or the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, composed of the different government agencies involved in providing information, including weather forecasts, near real-time information, etc., etc. But warnings must be matched in order for disasters to be averted by the appropriate response. That response effort is more difficult to do. Why? Because it entails a lot of uh, awareness activities. You have to engage people. There must be long-term education, knowledge building, and access to good, accurate, and reliable maps. UNISDR recommends probabilistic maps rather than deterministic maps. Why? Because deterministic maps, which are based on interviews, only capture the events or the hazards in memory of the people who you interview. Probabilistic maps, which are based on computer simulations and validations in the field, are produced from the knowledge of the physics of the flow of water and the physics of the stability of rocks. And probabilistic maps provide multi-scenarios, including scenarios that happened way back before living memory, before the historical record. And they also capture the hazards of future big events, including climate change impacts. So it's very important that we give warnings, and that must be matched by the appropriate response. And I'll show you later that these maps are very important to tell the people in the community so that when there's a warning, they go from one unsafe place to a safe place rather than from one unsafe place to another unsafe place. So it's very important that the appropriate response be matching with the accurate warnings. We've learned that with warnings for floods, that rivers normally stay flat. They don't rise when there's no weather disturbance. But when there's a typhoon, suddenly the water level of the river goes up. The X scale is uh, the time. And then disasters happen when there's a sudden peak or rise in water level of the river. And the trick to avert the disaster is to catch it while it's on the rise. How to do that? We've developed a system by which we were able to emplace or put or deploy sensors, rain gauges, water level sensors all over the Philippines, 1,500 in total, that stream data via SMS during normal days every 15 minutes, and when there's a typhoon in the Philippine area of responsibility via Iridium satellite. So here is a capture of the uh, rainfall events and how much took place in different places of the Philippines during, uh, let me see, this was 2013 during uh, Yolanda. 
So when we are able to detect rainfall that's heavy and sustained, because rainfall that happens over a span of one hour will only flood the streets. It causes nuisance floods. But rainfall that is torrential and prolonged over two, three, or six hours are the dangerous types of rainfall because they make the rivers swell. And when the rivers swell, it swells and uh, overtops the banks, floods the floodplains where many people live. So we are looking after rainfall that occurs, that's torrential, and over a prolonged period of time. Once we detect that, we zoom into the place, look at the water level sensor, and then catch it while it's on the rise. When we catch it while it's on the rise, we call it, in this example, we called Eric, that's not his family name, uh, he's from Tagaloan. We called him at 12.14, and after calling him, he evacuated everybody in the municipality of Tagaloan before it became too unmanageable. Peak floods happened at 6.10, and the result of that hazard event was only one casualty. It's the first time that Tagaloan experienced such kind of event. The biggest in more than 100 years. Never before have they experienced floods that overtop their dikes. But nonetheless, despite that extreme hazard, there was only one person who died. We would consider that as an averted disaster. That person who died refused to evacuate because he didn't want to leave the house. There was a, a, a pig that he wanted to take care of. Uh, he feared that it was going to be stolen. And since Project NOAA was established, uh, I, I refer you to this timeline. The blue field uh, refers to disasters averted. The pink field refers to uh, disasters with massive loss of lives. We start from 1999, Cherry Hill, 60 dead. Dingalan, 135 dead. Dingalan de Vrie 390 dead. Ginsa Ugon, 1,126. Frank floods, this is a very big storm, 2008 in Iloilo, 644 died. Ondoy, which hit Metro Manila, with a rise in water level of the Marikina River, which is about just three kilometers to the east of this place, 465 dead. That's a huge rise in water level, 10.99 meters. That's about the combined height of three basketball rings. That's, that's really a, a really very dangerous event. And then came uh, Pepeng floods. Pangasinan in La Union, in, in the Cordillera region, 465 died. 2011, Pedring and Kiel, 97 died. Central Luzon, Sendong floods, which was the trigger for the establishment of Project NOAA. Uh, 1,268 died in Cagayan de Oro and Iligan, south of the Philippines. In 2010, the disaster management law was signed into an act. So Project NOAA was uh, formed in 2012. We use that kind of system of catching the river water level while it's on the rise, but before doing that, trying to detect uh, the rainfall that occurs in the Philippines that's torrential and uh, prolonged. Since that time of the launch of Project NOAA, using the methods that I just described, 2012 Habagat floods, uh, let me see, sorry, 9.49 meters. It's less than Ondoy. This also happened in Metro Manila. But nonetheless, that's still an extreme event because 9.49 meters is still three basketball rings combined height. But despite that extreme event, zero deaths. Then Pablo came, six to seven meter rise in water level in Cagayan de Oro, one year after Sendong, which uh, killed 1,268, that's six to seven meter rise, that's still very large, zero deaths. But uh, all of these stories probably we don't hear about because it does not make the news. It's not interesting because there are zero dead people. Habagat 2013, again hitting the Philippines, 8.84 meter rise, we'll tackle this later. Habagat floods, 8.74 meters rise in water level. After Haiyan, we had ruby storm surges in one municipalities. Uh, one municipality of uh, uh, Daram, 1,664 houses were totally destroyed by storm surges. But despite uh, that event, even with other municipalities having houses being totally washed out, there were zero deaths. It didn't make the news, again, because it's uh, simply not newsworthy. Uh, Senyang floods, 7.7 .7 meters, one dead. This is an example that I gave to you. 
agaton floods to dead in Butuan, Butuan using the method that I, I described. Uh, they were advised nine hours in advance of uh, imminent floods. As you can see, there's no water level record because when we inform the mayor about the rise in water level that's going to happen nine hours later, the mayor got too scared. He went to the bridge, got the sensor for fear that it was going to get wet by the floods. So please don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. So we don't have a record. It's really for science and for saving lives. Uh, Ineng floods, seven to eight meters, zero dead, 6.2, Lawag, one dead, Lando debris flows. These were really extreme events. Lando, probably uh, you'll be more familiar with uh, the term or the name Kopu. Uh, it delivered a lot of rains, generated debris flows, 40 million cubic meters in volume. That's a world-class event because 40 million cubic meters is really huge. It's composed of rocks, mainly 85% rocks. A debris flow is defined as 85% rocks and 15% water. So it's really not a flowing river of water. It's a flowing river of boulders. Then none of the debris flows came uh, just two months after uh, Lando generated also debris flows, but despite those extreme events, Gabaldon, Laur, and also uh, Bongabon didn't experience any deaths. I think there was a, there's a group here who were there during Lando. I think you were there. Team 48, for, uh, Team 49 were there, and I know you've seen, you, you saw all of the debris flows that devastated Nueva Ecija. There was also a storm surge event in Legazpi, three meters height according to the disaster management officer. But despite that uh, storm surge event, because they were warned and the people made the appropriate response, it led to zero deaths. Now, all of these disasters averted could have easily gone down and become disasters. But because the warning was there and the people made the appropriate response, they averted the disasters and led to zero casualties. Now here, we have two examples. Pablo landslide debris flows. 566 people died in New Bataan, Compostela Valley. And of course, everybody knows about the high-end storm surges. There were many discussions about why many people died, despite the two days advance warning that storm surges up to five to six meters height we're going to occur. So we'll discuss that. Going back to our broad categories, the two categories were warning. There was warning two days in advance. One day in advance, it was no less than the president of the country who announced to, the, to our countrymen that storm surges that were deadly were going to hit Tacloban, Eastern Samar, and many places in the Central Philippines region. Again, if you go back to those two categories, no amount of accurate warning will work if hazard maps are inappropriate. So there was a warning, but the action was wrong. Why? I give you an example of, I think I mentioned again, the two types of maps, deterministic and probabilistic. This is a deterministic map. This is a probabilistic map, which is recommended by UNISDR because it captures the past big events and the future big events, including the climate change impacts, which is not present in what we call as deterministic maps, because they're based on interviews. This is the map that was available since 2010, available to all the LGUs, or local government units, in the central Philippines region. This one is in Leyte, this one is Tacloban, the airport is here. You can see the violet part, which refers to inundation areas up to four meters. But you can also see in the map that there are many places in the coastal environment, in the coastal areas, not, that's not going to be affected by storm surges. So if you were the LGU planner, you would plan that evacuation centers be put there, which is what they did. They put many evacuation centers in these places. Had we had these scenario-based maps, or what we call as probabilistic maps, then the story could have been different, but God knows really what could have happened. You can see that all of those evacuation centers, or most of the evacuation centers, were in the storm surge path. Why were those evacuation centers there? Probably, or most probably, 
they referred to these maps that did not depict the actual scenario because what it depicted was an underestimated scenario of storm surges. In fact, 70% of the evacuation centers in Tacloban, in Tacloban alone, were places that got hit by storm surges where thousands died. Another example is in Pablo. This is the second example that I showed in the disasters that had happened after Project NOAA. We have here this place. Uh, this again, this is a deterministic map based on interviews. You have Barangay Andap, which is located there. According to the deterministic map, it says low susceptibility to landslide. This was an evacuation center. 566 people trooped into that evacuation center. And when they trooped to that evacuation center, even after the map was changed to a high susceptible to flooding region after the disaster, it was changed after the disaster, that evacuation center was still the place where 566 people died. 566 people are buried underneath this pile of rubble. They're buried four meters underneath those rocks. So it looks like just a riverbed, but actually it's not a riverbed. It's the deposit of the 30 million cubic meter debris flow event that overwhelmed Barangay Andap, which overwhelmed the evacuation center. So again, we have the warning, and then we have the appropriate response. There was the warning for both Pablo and Haiyan events. We can discuss more about the Haiyan event, about uh, poor communication. It was made in English. Why it should have been, why it should, uh, why it was not uh, said to be like a tsunami. There are many opinions about it, but in my opinion, the maps were inappropriate. They went from one unsafe place to another unsafe place. So going back. How does open street mapping relate to our efforts? So we have that warning, and we must make good our map so that the people in the communities will do the appropriate response. So we've been doing open street mapping. Uh, this is Cavite. This is Camigin. Uh, let me see. It will show up how much we've, we've mapped. We map the residences, the buildings, the streets, so that we will know how many people will be affected by the hazard. And this is Sambales, for example. We've been doing it for 15 provinces. We're almost done. But there are 82 provinces in the country. So maybe some uh, international open street mappers can help us do this effort with Selena Agaton. We were working together. And you can see that. If we map out the vectors of the residential areas, the buildings, the streets, we'll have an idea on how many will be affected. Uh, that's Biliran, we'll not show that anymore. And we use that information, overlay it with the hazards, so us, we can count how many will be affected, so that we can prepare for the well, if there's a disaster, we prepare for the disaster. But we can, we can actually avert that. So all of those exposure data can be overlaid on top or underneath the hazard map, in this case a flood map, and be able to arrive at a calculation of how many are in harm.